My name is Kara Feeney. I'm the Director of Exhibitions at the Evanston Art Center. Um, a few reminders, please stay on mute while Rebecca is speaking. Um, you can turn yourself um, on mute. You should all already be on mute, but there is a mute button at the bottom of the screen. Um, if you have any questions for Rebecca, please use the chat function, which is also located at the bottom of the toolbar. Um, at the end of the lecture, we will answer as many questions as we can. So there may be some slides with text on the upper right hand side of the screen where you may need to adjust your screen or hit escape and um, that will make sure that the whole screen is shown. Um, and then a final note, we are recording this and we will post it on our website at a later date. Um, so now I would like to introduce to you Paula Danoff, our president and CEO, who will then introduce Rebecca. Thank you, Kara. Thank you for everyone for joining us today. This is going to be a wonderful program. Um, Rebecca is such an engaging um, person and uh, we've enjoyed um, having her here and obviously the topic couldn't be more timely. So um, as we all know, history does repeat itself. So um, with further ado, Rebecca Zorich is the Mary Jane Crow Professor of Art and Art History at Northwestern University. She teaches and writes on early modern European art, 15th to 17th century, contemporary activist art, and the art of the 1960s and 70s. Particular interests include print media, feminist and queer theory, theory of representation, African-American artists, and the multiple intersections of art and politics. Her most recent book, Art for People's Sake, Artists and Community in Black Chicago, 1965 to 1975, was published by Duke University Press in 2019. She is at work on a new project that will consider the relationship of artistic and political agency to national, excuse me, natural, it could be national, I suppose, and social ecologies. <laughs> She's a member of a free field tank Chicago, um, as on the board of the Southside Community Arts Center and Southside Projections and co-organizer of the Archive and Oral History Project, Never the Same, with Daniel Tucker. And that is at neverthesame.org. We are so honored and thrilled to have Rebecca with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, thank you both. And um, I, I realize that there, I, I think my, that bio is a tiny bit out of date in certain ways, but it's nice to hear it anyway. <laughs> um, and to remember some things that, you know, are a little bit less active now than they were probably a few years ago. Um, so I want to thank the Evanston Art Center very much for this invitation and, um, and, and really especially um, for their kind willingness to reschedule when I had a, a family situation that I, I just, I had to address. Um, so and thank you too to um, those of you who, who had signed up for the February 7th time slot and, and actually made it here on February 28th. I really, I'm, I'm really glad to, and, and glad for everyone who's, who's um, been able to join us. This is actually the first like really full length talk I've done on Zoom. I've done like class lectures, I've visited other people's classes, but this is the first time I'm like really doing a talk. So I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that it goes okay. Um, I am joining you from, um, as many of you probably are, but many of you are not, um, the ancestral land of the Council of the Three Fires, the Ojibwe, Potawatomi, and Odawa nations, which is also home to many other indigenous people, including the Miami, Ho-Chunk, and Menominee Menom nations. And I want to also, in, in, um, in saying that, I want to acknowledge that although the history of indigenous people in relation to art and abolition is not my main focus today, the history of their displacement and genocide is deeply intertwined with some of the things that I am going to be talking about. So um, as a matter of being able to um, not, you know, not, not do everything in one talk, um, I, I'm talking, I will be talking about histories of slavery in relation to museums. Um, I will not be talking um, about the displacement and genocide of indigenous people, but they're also very closely related to some of the things that I am talking about. Um, and I want to acknowledge um, that in um, addressing this particular topic, I'm building on the work of many, many other people, only some of whom I'll be referring to in this talk. And I especially want to mention um, 
let's see if I can advance my slide. First test. Uh, I especially want to mention the really important and incredibly powerful and brilliant work of Miriam Kaba, who um, has been an, an inspiration to me and um, I think a, a, a number of people around the Northwestern community um, became aware of her most recently through her keynote lecture for the MLK Dream Week at Northwestern last month. Um, others have been aware of her for a very long time and inspired by her work for a long time. Um, and I really wanted to have, I'm, uh, this is a new book that's just out by her and I really wanted to be able to have my copy of it before <laughs> doing this talk because I, I knew I would find words of wisdom in it. Unfortunately, the mail being what it is these days, it hasn't arrived yet, but, um, but I still want to plug it because I think everyone should buy it and read it. And I will also mention, not because of myself, but because of the, the, the brilliant contributors who are, I was fortunate enough to be able to assemble into this book, um, a book that I published, um, that I edited in 2014 called Art Against the Law. And a lot of what I know about art and abolition um, is, you know, from the process of, of editing this book and working with the amazing authors who contributed to it, including Mariam Kaba. Um, I, I'm also giving you two possible URLs for, um, for, for finding this book. You can find a free PDF of it at Half Letter Press, um, and you can buy the actual book either at Half Letter Press or at the um, U Chicago Press website. Um, and let's see, other acknowledgments. Finally, <laughs> I think this is the last one. I want to acknowledge um, the student organizers of um, NU Community Not Cops and the incredible work they've been doing to um, keep the issue of abolition, that PIC abolition, that is to say prison industrial complex abolition at the forefront of student activism and campus life um, in the past year. And, and I also just wanna say I'm, I'm trying to pitch this talk to an audience that doesn't necessarily know a whole lot about these things, but um, hope that, hoping that I'm not gonna lose those of you who do. Um, so I'll, I'll see what I can do with that. And I am, um, delving quite a bit into history. So like true to my uh, professional identity as an art historian, I'm gonna be talking about a lot of historical material as well as some contemporary material today. So, all right. Um, so I started with an image, um, I, I, I've, I'm not gonna go back to it, but the, an image with a, with a sign with a slogan, defund the police, uh, really brilliant use of cutouts um, of the, the words defund the police in a, in a protest sign. And I'm hoping that this phrase is by now familiar to um, most of you, and, and if not all of you. And it's become a familiar one, although often treated with a kind of mock um, confusion by the media. Recent years have seen broadening public awareness of the movement for abolition of the prison industrial complex, in part thanks to the well-publicized protests of last June, which responded most immediately to the police murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, but also drew on a long history of dedicated organizing against anti-blackness, police violence, and prisons. Of course, police abuses in the US have rarely been far from the consciousness of black and brown Americans, but we've seen more and more of the slogan defund the police and broader awareness of a political movement for PIC abolition in recent years. So just to give a bit of a definition, I understand this to be a movement for the actual abolishing of the institutions of police and prison as institutions that do more harm than good the in interrogation of how deeply other institutions and individual and collective consciousness has been infused with what are called carceral logics, the modes of thinking shaped by the PIC, and the creation of new ways of being in society with one another. And that last is a really crucial one, and it's the one I think perhaps most relevant, although they're all relevant to art, um, in terms of what artists can do for the movement. Art can be involved in all of these efforts, and I'm going to spend some time on a few examples in this talk toward the end of the talk. So, but I'm, I'm showing you just a few examples um, up on the screen right now of artists, um, Chicago artists in particular, um, who've addressed issues related to incarceration, incarceration policing, and police brutality, and, um, and police torture. So these are a few, just a few examples from the, from the past 12 years, and I'm, I'm hoping that you've had a chance to kind of look, look a little bit at them and look at the labels as I'm talking. I will cut the top two on this, on, this, on this slide I'm gonna come back to and spend quite a bit more time with at the end of the talk. But before I get into 
examples, more examples and discussion of, of what I have called abolition art. I want to spend some time being an art historian, looking deeper into history to think about ways in which art and its institutions in the United States are intertwined with police and both with white supremacy. In a contemporary sense, this is brought up by controversies over monuments, whether they're Confederate generals, here the um, Robert E. Lee statue in Richmond, Virginia, which has been overlaid with this really amazing both graffiti and projected images and text um, by artists and activists. Um, or Christopher Columbus, this is the Christopher Columbus statue in downtown Chicago. These artworks, these monuments, don't just tell stories about history. They say whose history matters. They communicate messages about who is held to belong in public space. And in their unmaking, they tell us something about who is challenging the current order. In Chicago, when activists rallied against the statue of Christopher Columbus in Grant Park last June, some of them attempting to topple it, they were met with an enormous police presence. Protesters were pepper sprayed, pulled off bicycles, slammed to the ground. One young woman, Miracle Boyd, had a tooth knocked out by an officer's punch. How did it become so important to put police resources into protecting a statue? Perhaps some of the reason the police were so intent on protecting the monument has to do with Chicago's own history. We can look, for example, to the police monument that once stood near the spot of the Haymarket Affair of 1886. So I'm just gonna give a highly abbreviated version of this story for those who aren't familiar with it. In this protest against the killing of one striking worker and wounding of others by police in a prior incident, a bomb exploded, police fired into the crowd, and 11 people died in the ensuing melee, including both police and protesters. In the aftermath, four protest organizers were executed by hanging by the state of Illinois. The workers' experiences that workers' experience is commemorated in a number of different ways, but the, in 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 a way the most the most internationally prominent is the International Workers' Holiday May Day, celebrated all around the globe, though barely at all in the United States. In the U.S., to make it abundantly clear that we aren't communists, May first is officially proclaimed both. Law Day and Loyalty Day, two separate holidays, both on May 1st, neither of them May Day, right? Ever since Dwight Eisenhower. The police officers who died are commemorated by the monument I'm showing you now, which originally stood at the site of the incident itself and now stands at CPD headquarters at 35th and Michigan. For years after its installation in 1889, the police monument was vandalized, bombed, and moved here and there to protect it. It was attacked in 1927 by a rogue streetcar driver who ran into it, later reporting that he was sick of seeing that policeman with his arm raised. It was attacked by the weather underground. It finally found its current home in 2007 behind the police headquarters. Um, so just to think back to, so this is like, the, you know, my sense of like, this is, um, you know, the, the kind of potential relevance in Chicago to the, the relationship between monuments and police. Um, but in the broader sense, people often argue that removing monuments means erasing history. But there's a long history of monuments being taken down to respond to political evolution and revolution. So here's an example. This is um, an anonymous etching from a Parisian newspaper of 1792 showing a statue of Louis XIV uh, being torn down by a revolutionary crowd. Here's a uh, humorous um, response, a meme, uh, response to those who've said that removing statues means erasing history, right? And that's why no one knows who won the American Revolution. Trying to keep it lively here. So what does it mean for the police to put so much effort into protecting art? If it is not art that they're protecting but order, why is it that art invokes the notion of order? Although in the museum, it may be in part the financial value of objects that's at stake, and this is another whole conversation, with monuments, it seems to be something else. I want to press here on the not merely incidental relationship between art and order, or what I might call the ruliness of art as opposed to its unruliness. So I want you to think for a minute about what the rules of art are. I'm just going to, I'm not going to talk for a minute. I'm just going to let you think, what are the rules of art or what are some of the rules of art? 
So a really obvious one is don't touch, right? There are many others. Um, artistic genres and media have their own conventions. We can typically recognize what constitutes a portrait, and we can also recognize when a particular portrait violates the conventions of what defines a portrait. And I'm showing you the Mona Lisa in part because of the don't touch command, but also, um, also because it, it fulfills generally the, the, the rules on what a portrait should look like. Um, Art academies, I'm showing you a, a text that emerged from one of them, um, that were established in European countries in the late 16th and 17th centuries also developed elaborate regulations that established hierarchies and practices for art and social and behavioral structures for artists. Many modern art movements have established themselves as a practice of violating the preceding conventions that define art. Some of them set up their own rules or anti-rules. So this is Dada and Fluxus. Many forms of contemporary art operate through projects and performances that require artists and or audiences who sometimes become participants to adhere to an articulated set of rules. One might go so far as to suggest that, that the point of some modes of art making, and I'm thinking of some modes of conceptual art or performance art, was actually to draw attention to the rule bound character of art, kind of distilling it down to just the rules. Um, to its ruliness. What happens when you follow the rules, but still in some sense break them? So this is an example. This is um, Anya Liftig's performance, The Anxiety of Influence, which she conducted as an intervention into Marima, Marina Abramovich's The Artist is Present um, in 2010 at MoMA. And she's, she, in an interview, she talks about the rules that she was given. I was given three rules by the guards, must be silent, no movement, no putting anything on the table. I had no intention of speaking anyway. So the idea of this performance, of Abramovich's performance, which was a re-performance of an earlier performance, is that anyone could wait in line to sit in silent conversation with her, um, but the assumption was that people would get up and go eventually, right, and, and Liftig stayed for the whole day. I also have a couple of quotes on this slide from Art, an art critic and an, an art historian. Um, I don't, I, it might be too much to try to encapsulate Abby Vorberg in, in, the, in the term art historian, but um, colloquially, I think we often colloquially allude to the idea of policing the borders of what constitutes art. And these are just two examples, quotations from, from authors um, talking about you know, the idea that they, will, that they are not policing the borders, even if maybe in some cases they are. Um, and I would say maybe in particular, Bishop, I think, does police the, the boundaries. I'm not so sure that Barberg did. So this is just to give a sense, kind of a general sense, of um, ways in which art operates in relation to rules. But ruliness under racial capitalism in the United States has its own specific features. And I want to turn now to a, the history of art institutions in the United States and think about the kind of order that they've historically reflected and enforced. For this, I want to take us to the early 19th century. So this is not the early 19th century right here, but I'm, I'm getting there. Historians typically place American museums, historians of museums, let me say, his, typically place American museums in a genealogy that begins with the great European public museums of the 19th century, in particular with the Louvre's opening as a public museum following the French Revolution, and the Louvre is what you're seeing on the left. In this sequential ordering of history, American art institutions appear in the later 19th century, building on European precedents to create universal survey museums like the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which you're seeing on the right, founded in New York City in 1870. Scholarship on the history and theory of museums typically tracks their development in Europe up through the mid 19th century before starting to consider American museums as modeled on the European type. But there were museums in the United States before the late 19th century. Some existed even before the founding of the Republic and almost all of them had connections to slavery, to money made in the transatlantic slave trade and money made through the exploitation of enslaved African captives, whether on a household or a plantation scale. I take just one case here, but it's an especially consequential one, the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts founded in 1805 in Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. 
And I just have to say, as a, as a full disclosure, I actually took two classes at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts when I was a postdoc at the University of Pennsylvania many, many years ago. Um, and I loved the classes, but I didn't do very well in them. But this is not retribution for, um, for that. Um, so the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts bills itself as the first art museum and school founded in the United States. Along with the sculptor William Rush, its chief founder was Charles Wilson Peale. Charles Wilson Peale enslaved several people in his own household, including one whose name is recorded as Moses Williams, who labored in Peale's first museum, Museum of Natural History and Attractions, simply known as Peale's Museum. Now, slavery was abolished preliminarily in Pennsylvania with a Gradual Emancipation Act of 1780, but the law did not require that captives be freed if they had been enslaved before that date. There were still enslaved people listed in the Pennsylvania census as late as 1840. Peel legally acknowledged Moses Williams' freedom in around 1805, just before the founding of the Pennsylvania Academy. And I just want to note that it is not true, as the Wikipedia entry on Moses Williams states, that, quote, the law mandated that nine-year-old Moses remain in Peel's service until his 27th birthday. Actually, that was Peel's choice. The law said that Peel could keep him in captivity, but did it, it did not in any way require him to. The Academy was founded after Peel acknowledged Moses Williams' freedom. And so the relationship of slavery to the new institution would seem to stop here. But there is more. To build the new institution, Peel not only transferred fine art objects from the museum, thus defining whose artworks constituted art and whose did not, so depending on the, the cultural background of, the, of the, um, the makers of the objects, they, were, they either remained in the museum, which became a natural history and ethnography museum, or they were moved to the Pennsylvania Academy. But he also received gifts from other collectors, and one of those collectors was the South Carolinian Joseph Allen Smith. Among the objects transferred from the museum to the academy were the plaster casts of antique sculpture that had been brought from Europe by Smith. Now these are not those casts, those almost all, if, if not all, um, were destroyed in a fire in 1845. But they were the kinds of plaster casts, these kinds of plaster casts used for art education in the European tradition and, and into the, um, the, the American tradition of art academies in the 19th century. So um, these gifts were particularly important to the Academy's identity as a collecting institution in addition to being one that could provide high quality art instruction. And these, or casts like these, provided the starkly white plaster casts of canonical Roman statuary that were considered indispensable for the training of young artists who copied from them to learn the canonical body types and poses. Now, as you can see from this portrait, Joseph Allen Smith was an early American traveler in the mold of the European Grand Tour. You may have caught on that I said that he was from South Carolina and you may have guessed what might come next. Although it has not been mentioned in any of the scholarship I've found on his philanthropy, on his artistic philanthropy, it doesn't take much digging to figure out that the wealth that enabled Smith to travel to Europe and acquire these collections derived directly from the slave trade. Smith's father, Benjamin, who served as Speaker of South Carolina's Royal Assembly from 1755 to 1763, was no simple plantation owner, but a major slave trader in Charleston. His firm, Smith, Bruton, and Smith did a substantial business in African captives for decades in the mid 18th century. And Benjamin's second wife, Mary, Joseph Allen Smith's mother, was the daughter of Joseph Ragg, whose business as a slave trader was one of the largest in all of the colonies. Ragg was considered a pioneer of the transatlantic slave trade. Joseph, Joseph Ragg, Joseph Allen Smith was named for him. So one might imagine that the purchase of artworks with literal blood money and subsequent donation to a high-minded civic institution was a form of art washing designed to clean up the family image. But what if there is more ideological consistency here than we want to find? What if in shipping across the Atlantic, the trade in art and the trade in human captives are simply different registers of the same white supremacy? Cultural institutions took part in the imposition of whiteness on the land, a whiteness that went by the name civilization. 
Now, because of an accident of history, it turns out that one of Smith's shipments of artworks had even farther reaching consequences for the constitution of art and its institutions in the United States, and indeed in international cultural property law. Smith first traveled to Italy in the 1790s, but many of the works he acquired were waylaid in the course of the Napoleonic Wars. He shipped some of the collection back in 1800, the rest awaited shipment back in Italy when he came back to the United States. In 1807, the same year Congress voted to end the transatlantic slave trade, Smith returned from Europe. Pleased by the progress of the Pennsylvania Academy, he decided to give his remaining stored works to the new institution. These Italian paintings and engravings included works by such artists as Guido Reni, Salvatore Rosa, and Bartolomeo Schedoni. They were loaded on an American ship, the Marquis de Summerwell, that set sail from Civita Vecchia for Salem, Massachusetts in 1812. So 1812, there's a war on, and the ship was captured by the British Royal Navy. Its cargo was detained and taken to Halifax, Nova Scotia. Normally, captured cargo was considered the prize of the captain to be kept, sold, or otherwise distributed at his pleasure. But the Academy sought ownership of the artworks in the British court in Halifax, and the court returned a judgment in its favor, establishing a key principle in the international law of cultural property. Uh, there. Oops. Okay. So Echoing an important letter by the French writer Quatremer de Quincy, who had denounced the looting of Italian cultural heritage, objects of Italian cultural heritage by Napoleon's army, the judge, Sir Alexander Croke, wrote that the arts and sciences are admitted amongst all civilized nations as forming an exception to the severe rights of warfare and is entitled to favor and protection. They're considered not as the peculium of this or that nation, but as the property of mankind at large and as belonging to the common interests of the whole species. So he ordered that the artworks be delivered to the academy. The rationale for it was that the pursuit of the arts will have a beneficial effect on American morals. And you can see that in the quote that appears here, the advancement of the polite arts, the idea that a, 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 a new artist of the school of Raphael will appear in the American wilderness. This court decision is still cited in questions of cultural property. It constituted art objects as a special form of property that belongs to all, at least all civilized peoples, and is thus in a sense outside the normal laws of property, specifically outside the rules of war for captured booty. It does not, however, establish where the best location is for art artworks to be housed. Quatremer de Quincy had argued that by staying in their original site, that is in Italy, Italian artworks best maintained their existence as part of the collective patrimony of all Europe. The Summerwell judgment rests on a different argument, not that the works should remain in situ, but that they should be delivered where they're intended to serve the public interest, rather than being confiscated into private ownership. So this position could actually just as easily rationalize looting as condemn it. It's the idea that the works belong where they can do the, the idea that the works belong where they can do the most moral good is readily molded by ideology. By doing the most good here, someone like Croak meant best reinforcing whiteness, Europeanness. So there are many layers here that we might consider, but I want to spend a little bit of time focusing on that little word polite that I've highlighted on this page um, that, that Croak alluded to in his judgment, and I want to push on it a little bit. So polite, police, they differ only by one letter. Whether this is just a little bit of wordplay is something that we might get at by looking at what the word police meant before it took on the meaning of police force that it has today. Before it was about individual officers, it was about the thing that this force was supposed to produce. And essentially that thing was order, propriety, and cleanliness. The word comes in the first instance from the realm of politics and policy, but it also has an aesthetic aspect. It was about systems and it was about beauty, and it was also almost in indistinguishable from its near homophone polish. So to think about how these words are intertwined, I turn to the words of another Smith, this time Adam Smith, the philosopher perhaps best known for the so-called invisible hand of market fundamentalism and economics. 
Smith's theory of the moral sentiments from 1759 has a lot to say about aesthetics and the arts. And here you can see him describe the orderly state as an aesthetic object. The perfection of police, the extension of trade and manufactures are noble and magnificent objects. The contemplation of them pleases us and we're interested in whatever can tend to advance them. They make part of, this, of the great system of government and the wheels of the political machine seem to move with more harmony and ease by means of them. We take pleasure in beholding the perfection of so beautiful and grand a system. Okay, I won't continue reading, but you get, you get the idea. By police here, he doesn't mean a police force. He means order, peaceful and systematic arrangement of society, polite society, and polish. Next to Smith on the right, I also include a passage from an early history of New York City that demonstrates the way the word evolved by the mid 19th century. The Department of Police is what's supposed to produce these qualities in society, but in this case, the word has evolved in the direction of safety and security, and order emphasizes the suppression of disorder. The word is becoming attached to the people charged with carrying it out and given the tools of violence to do it. And it comes to mean something much like what we understand by it today. But I wanna argue that it carries along with it this idea, this aesthetic idea that it, that it had in the 18th century. So police in um, Adam Smith's writing seems to relate to the cluster of words around politics, policy, and polity derived from the Greek polis, you can see that at the bottom of the slide, um, and politeia, which comes into European languages through the Latin, Latin politia. But the Latin word politia also has another meaning, polish or refinement, which comes from the verb polire, to polish. So political order and aesthetic value come together in this word. Adam Smith, in turn, sees the police of a country and its political order as closely related to its aesthetically pleasing arrangement. Given the aesthetic investments that also exist in the word police and its relationship to beauty, it would not have been at all strange in the late 18th or early 19th century for someone like Smith or even like the other Smith to say that museums bring police to society. And by later in the 19th century, it will be clear that art and museums constitute one of those things that the police force is designed to protect. Okay, so I'm finishing up with my historical, um, my, my, uh, historical uh, reflections, and I'm gonna look forward to, um, to your questions about them, but I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on some contemporary art as well. And I also wanna say, okay, where does this leave us, those of us who love art? Where does this kind of, like digging into this kind of history leave us? It means, I think, that the definition of art must be shaped all the more urgently by work that takes on police and prisons, that critiques museums and their histories, and that tangles with this difficult history. I'm in no way saying that we have to discard the key components of what we typically understand art to be, beauty, creativity, imagination, joy, even the making of attractive objects, even the making of compelling performances. In fact, if we rethink the ideological place of art in the history of this country, we might emerge with a broader appreciation of those qualities. We might have the sense that those qualities have been hijacked by uh, white supremacy and that the, we, we, we might think about rescuing them. I'd suggest that the works and projects I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, and which I'll go into a little bit more um, in the next few minutes, are not just art making that takes policing and prisons as the content of its practice, as a subject to be communicated, but something that really intervenes radically in what art in this country is, what it can be, what purposes it serves. So just to give a little bit of context, there have been many, many exhibitions in Chicago in let's say the past 10 years um, and nationally also um, that deal with, that, that can be understood as abolitionist projects um, that deal with questions of police brutality, policing, um, and incarceration. I encourage you to explore them. So I'm, I'm you know, if you, if, you know, I, I encourage you to you know, just kind of pick up, um, take, take some notes and get the titles of the exhibitions and their locations if you don't know them already and to you know, look them up and, and uh, page through the gallery and museum sites 
that have a lot of information on them. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these exhibitions, but just to note a few. Um, this one is Our Duty to Fight, which was at Gallery 400 at UIC in 2016, curated by Black Lives Matter. Do Not Resist, 100 Years of Chicago Police Violence at Hairpin Art Center in Chicago in 2018, which was curated by members of For the People Artists Collective. This is um, Walls Turned Sideways, Artists Confront the Justice System at Contemporary Arts Museum Houston, which was curated by Risa Puleo, who's a PhD student at uh, Northwestern, PhD candidate at Northwestern in Art History. And um, this is the current um, exhibition at MoMA PS1 in New York, um, curated by Nicole Fleetwood, Marking Time, Art in the Age of Mass Incarceration. So these are, I, I think that, that you know, the, the relationship between art and ab abolitionist organizing is really, is, is displayed well in these kind of collective projects of these exhibitions. I'm gonna talk about uh, just a couple of specific examples. Um, one that's a collective project and one that, they're actually both collective project, one spearheaded by one artist in particular, but, um, but they're both collective projects. And I think that that reflects something of the, the practice as well. So the first one I wanna talk about is Opening the Black Box, The Charge is Torture, which was organized by Chicago Torture Justice Memorials at the Sullivan Gallery at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago in 2012. Um, and, and the Chicago Torture Justice Memorials group with several other organizations helped set in motion the process that led to Chicago's groundbreak, groundbreaking reparations ordinance for police torture. The ordinance supports survivors of the police torture that occurred under Commander John Burge from the 1970s to the 1990s and requires a curriculum that studies this history in Chicago public schools for eighth graders and for 10th graders. Activists turned to art when they had run out of legal powers. Burge had been convicted of perjury, but not of the actual torture that he conducted personally and that he supervised in his career. And the exonerated survivors were struggling not only with terrible memories, but also with the challenges of life on the outside with few resources that they could tap. Now art might seem like a fragile answer to these horrors, but art can remember in ways that courts cannot. It can speculate, it can evoke, it can imagine, it can engage. So CJTM invited proposals for imagined memorials and created visible documentation of both the atrocities and the struggle for justice. The conversations generated by the exhibition helped propel the issue to the city council and eventually to the ordinance. So displayed here is a signature wall that invited survivors to inscribe their names on a list for all to see. One survivor, Marvin Reeves, said afterward, to me, the exhibit means recognition. We all know in the world that recognition means a lot. And that's what that wall means. When I signed my name on that wall, that wall meant freedom. And I think we can think of that in, in contrast to the walls of the prison. Um. So this, the, the, the signature wall is carried forward in the design for um, Breath, Form, and Freedom, the design that was selected in 2019 for the public memorial by Chicago Justice Memorials um, and really was selected by the survivors themselves. Um, so this is, a, this is a design by Patricia Nguyen and John Lee. Um, it hasn't been built yet, but, um, and, and maybe someone who's here in this, um, in, in this Zoom room can, can tell us more about that, I'm not sure, but it's, um, but it's in the works and it in incorporates the signature wall in the, um, the, the wall of names that you can see in the, in the foreground of the um, memorial. Okay. The walls of the Cook County Jail themselves became an artistic medium for Maria Gaspar, an interdisciplinary artist from Chicago, in her own work and in a collaborative project that she initiated, 96 Acres. Gaspar originally trained as a muralist and continues to draw on the energies of a strong Chicago tradition in mural and public arts. Not only as a matter of painting walls, this work is also about engaging deeply with the very idea of a wall. This is an image of Gaspar's viscerally challenging piece. <clears throat> Excuse me. Haunting Raises Specters, presented at the Jane Addams Hull House Museum in 2015. 
The ghostly installation was a movable translucent curtain printed with an image of the full length of the 850 foot long north facing wall of Cook County Jail with all its cracks and stains. Hanging on a curving track system, the curtain flowed lightly with the breeze and enfolded visitors who moved through it, through and around it, into smaller spaces created by the shape of the track. It was disorienting. It was easy to lose the sense of which side of the wall you were supposed to be on. The piece is closely connected to the collective project, 96 Acres, which Gaspar also initiated um, in, in 2012 as she sought creative ways to think, talk, and visualize across barriers to visibility and knowledge, in particular the barriers created by incarceration. 96 Acres drew on the energies of Chicago's restorative justice and activist artist movements and created a broad and intergenerational collaboration among activists, artists, and cultural workers. She invited performances, installations, audio and film projects, and public art interventions that occurred around the jail while working closely with inmates to make their stories heard. One of the most powerful interventions was the project undertaken by young people from Yolo Kali Arts Reach, making creative use of years of accumulated city dirt on the walls and sidewalks around the jail. The young people used stencils to power wash phrases like, what's your role, and this is not a rehearsal, onto these surfaces. I'm gonna play a short video, it's about four minutes long, um, to give you a sense of the, the process. And then I just have a, a page left of my talk. I'm almost done. I'm the director of Yolo Cali Arts Reach. We are the teen and youth program of the National Museum of Mexican Art. We give free art programs to teens and young adults, mainly in the Pilsen and Little Village area. So we have some uh, really great young people that we've worked with. When we got this opportunity from 96 Acres, it was a really great way to get them involved in a project that's outside and doing something a little bit more different than what they're kind of used to. We are power washing phrases that the young people chose to put alongside the Cook County Jail. So it's a, an act of clean graffiti or reverse graffiti. So instead of applying paint to a surface, you're cleaning the surface. We're being overly ambitious and going to try to do along the whole jail. We just want to make an impression. Well, I run a sports-based youth community development organization called Beyond the Ball. We work with young people and their families through sport and play. We do a lot of uh, community cleanups and reclaiming public play spaces. And this is a natural thing for us to want to be involved in a positive thing like this that gets young people involved and makes the neighborhood a better place for everybody. Because Maria and uh, some other people from 96 Acres came out to talk to them. So I think that helped them generate the phrases. So these were the ones that the Cook County Board selected to, to be a part of the jail though. I'm more on the today is your day one or what's your role. I really like that one because it kind of plays more with what does it mean to have a jail in the community and what does it mean to see the jail throughout the neighborhood. I think it's getting people to think about it like uh, the jail's here, it's my backyard, but like doing this is like, you know, it's starting to get your thoughts like, yo, yeah, why do we have a jail like right here and in this community and like that makes so much money has something like this here, you know? And we don't have a museum. We use the pressure washer in the neighborhood usually to remove graffiti. And this is interesting because this is like reverse graffiti. So I, I really love this idea to use it to put a positive message just by cleaning. Seeing like, oh, today's your day. It might just change your thought on something that just happened or something like an argument you might have had with a loved one in there. When you look at the jail, you see people, but you don't see them as a person. person. You see them as someone that did something bad, someone that's just bad in society and deserve to be the place they are. But sometimes things that people don't really do bad things to be in there. Well, yeah, I have family that's incarcerated, you know? When my, my cousins were here, I would visit them almost every other week. It sucks, you can't really talk to him. We're talking through a little hole and like, everybody's talking so loud and you can't really say too much to him, you know? All you can say is keep your head up and like, Stay strong, so it's gonna be all right, but yeah. I, I think living in Little Village, the jail's a, a constant reminder of the struggles of not only our community, but other communities all around Chicago, around the country, around the world, really that live in poverty. And, and just the uh, mass amount of incarceration that occurs, it's perplexing, you know, because there's, there's two sides to every story. And I think 
a project like this, it helps people get to see, you know, both sides. All the families that are broken up and the people who come to visit, you're, you're constantly reminded. I think when you don't live by a jail, you don't, you don't you think about, you know, people who are incarcerated or their families, you know, but living here and being so close to, to Cook County Jail, as you're driving by, you see people walking by, moms with strollers, parents, and uh, it really brings that, that uh, human aspect to the complexity of mass incarceration. Okay, oops, I don't wanna play it again. <laughs> Stop. Okay, um, so in a state where graffiti writing can land you in that very jail for months, and sidewalks rather than marking on them. And as you notice from the video, the phrases had to be approved by the jail, right? So they might not be as critical as the young people would have wanted if given the choice. In their shades of gray, the words whisper, they don't shout. At the same time, their very open-endedness carries potential. And I think the critique, I would imagine at, at any rate, that the critique remains lodged in the student's experience. Many other examples could be cited um, of art that relates very directly to police and prisons. At the same time, I wanna think that there are many modes of art making that can ally themselves with abolition when we understand it broadly. And when we think about the creative component of abolition, Mariam Kaba always emphasizes that ima the imagination that is needed to practice abolition because it is not just about keeping everything else the same just getting rid of police and prisons rather it's about fundamentally transforming society and to fundamentally transform society we have to be creative i often return to a term that was coined by the surrealist writer andre breton for the assumption that nothing can change because nothing can change miserableism Surrealism responded in all kinds of ways that were also problematic, but continue to be, um, I think, significant with the unleashing of radical imagination, the thought that actually things could be otherwise, along with the wealth of art practices that intervene forcefully in oppressive structures to change them. There are those also that reimagine social relationships that innovate networks of care that hold space or in quieter ways ignite thinking. They might not always advertise themselves as abolitionists, but the urgent task of abolition can embrace them all. Thank you. And I will stop sharing. Okay. So I see there are some things in the chat already. Yeah, so if anyone has any questions, they should go ahead and type it in the chat function um thank you rebecca that was wonderful well thank you for having me yeah i'm i look forward to any questions that anyone might have um i see inda's uh in thinking of the rules of art i'm also thinking of the evolution of classical european art absolutely in trump's order for classical civic architecture yeah i mean i think that's that's of a piece with um with this history and um it's no no accident that that trump chose uh, that you know that the, the people trying to use him for their agenda chose classicism i mean if people want to speak up with their questions too they could they could rate do the hand raising thing oh jennifer Um, thanks for that talk. I'm so glad that I was able to make it. Um, really interested. I'm going to ask you other questions later about some of the weird 19th century stuff you showed. But my question for now is, um, like, I know like a lot of people who are working to do this defund stuff. Um, I'm going to make a parallel between politics and art institutions here. So I know a lot of people are like, uh you know like voting for these jerks like look what happens now we're just bombing Syria. like this sucks like um the real effect of politics is in the streets like blah 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 blah. um and i guess do you see that kind of divide as well when you're sort of thinking about abolition art like art that's trying to 
be in a museum, be in a gallery versus art that's trying to be like on the jail? And do you think that that's a thing, um, like a division that you could riff on or have observed anything about? I think, I mean, what I immediately think of is, um, is uh, diversity of tactics and um, the idea that, and that could, that, you know, that could exist in a single artist or collective practice, um, that there are plenty of artists who are out in the streets or who, you know, people who are doing creative things out in the streets, who are supporting, um, supporting direct action um, with their with their artistic talents, right? Who are also exhibiting in small galleries, who are and happy to, you know, take in some. I mean, it, I think it, you know they're happy to take up some space in a major museum as well, and to and to use that as a platform for getting ideas out. Um, I think that there are times when it also makes the most sense for artists, politically engaged artists, to say no to a museum and to like be very public about that in a way that also makes a statement and gets, you know, gets ideas circulating. Um, and, you know, thinking of like um, Michael Rakowitz at the Whitney Biennial and, um, you know, people who like pull out for very, for, um, you know, very specific reasons. Um, but the, I mean, I, I think that, um, uh, yeah, I mean, I think most most people I know who are who are activist artists are you know kind of see see like points of intervention in in different you know in the streets in possibly in institutions and are willing to use both and and a spectrum between them. I'm oh 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 sorry, um, Heike. Um, I just wanted to thank you for that talk about the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. I worked there for seven years and I had never heard that story. Um, wow. Yeah. So wow. thank you for digging that up because, <laughs> again, I think that really gives you a totally different understanding um, of where we are today, not just how we started, but where we are today. Um, and, and also the police piece is really, really important. The, la the language and, and where we are in terms of what that means, uh, how a museum functions in every aspect, how we raise money, how we engage with visitors, right? If we don't see it through that lens, if we don't know that track we've been on, well, then we're really missing some, some crucial pieces. So thank you, I just wanted to put that out there. Thank you. Thank you. I, you know, I, I had wondered actually about, um, I mean, I have, have actually that some of this work that I've been doing, I was thinking about sharing with Bob Cozzolino and, and ask him like if he knew any of this when he was at the Pennsylvania yeah. Academy. Um, but I, um, but I, uh, you know, I wondered how much of this is n known there now, you know, it's, I mean, it's, 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 it's striking to me how these kind of laudatory, um, scholarly articles about Joseph Allen Smith from as recently as the 1990s, like just no curiosity about like, where did this, where did all this money come from, from this South Carolinian in, in you know, 1800? <laughs> yeah, so anyway, thank you. Um, I think Claudia. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Um, I want to follow up on on Heike, I and mean, that's just a fascinating story. And um, so, without detracting from the great impact of an import of what you were talking about about contemporary art, I, I want to ask a historical question, and it has to do with that um, the congruence between the language of policing and, as you pointed out, etymologically polish. And I just wondered, do you feel like that's um, uh, I mean, infelicitous congruence for that moment, because you, you referred to an aesthetics that could be, you know, that runs parallel to these concerns with what is a polity, a polished polity or something like that. So is that, um, and as somebody who's, you know, really interested in a longer history of how moments of theft and appropriation and pirating um, lay claims for uh, cultural ownership. I'm just wondering, is that just, would you say, well, you know, that's just an interesting congruence at that moment, or do you feel like that has a strong, longer um, 
a longer story to tell? I, I think there's a longer story to tell. I'm not ready to tell it, um, but I, I think there is. I mean, I think one of the things that was striking to me, I was looking for early uses of the word police in um, or, or like either like department of police in quotes or police force in quotes. And I, you know, looking like doing like Google engram searches to find what the earliest, earliest um, citations would be. And almost all of them were colonial. They were like colonial settings. And so, you know, settler colonialism in the, in the early United States, but also like other, you know, British colonialism around the world. Um, and so, um, so that's something that I want to follow up on and think about. And, and, but I, I mean, I think that, and, and, you know, just to kind of like trace how the words being used in this aesthetic sense and when it shifts um, into like departments of police, like at what point, you know, is it about something called security and or safety and when is it about kind of enforcing order in this sense that could be understand understood aesthetically right and the and this you know there's a big overlap between those things too and i think the the overlap continues it's just i think a, a matter of kind of like what's on the surface um so yeah i want to I, I do want to I, I do want to think more about that um and kind of follow up on some of these other colonial leads yeah i also wondered what how your comments would overlap with claims that jennifer roberts has made about surface um surfaces in transition uh, or you know surfaces in transit i would say i mean it's just a yeah yeah uh, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. and i think it's also not coincidental that an aesthetics of sheen um and highly polished paintings in the Netherlands in the 17th century and shiny objects, mother of pearl and all those things coincides with the first capitalist economy. Mm -hmm. you know, but there's, a, so. Yeah, and the, I mean, the commodity fetish and the, sh the, sh the shine, yeah, that's interesting. I'll have to, I'll think, I'll think some more about that. Thank you. Um, uh, yeah, I'm seeing all kinds of great comments. Um, I mean, I think one, you know, when I originally thought about doing this, uh, how I was going to do this talk, I was was going to spend more time on PNAP, the Prison Neighborhood Art Project, and some of their. Um, th so this is this is to Hinda's question. Um, their some of their work um, working with incarcerated artists in particular, so teaching art classes, um, and this is following on along a tradition that comes, you know, at least as far back as Margaret Burroughs, the founder of the Dusable Museum and and one of the founders of the Southside Community Art Center, who taught um, art in Stateville for many many years, and um, and then you know the PNAP has been doing um, doing classes there and um, and uh, bringing art you know bringing artists works in finding creative ways to bring works of artists from incarcerated artists into public view um uh that's that's the one that sort of immediately jumps to mind is something that i that i would have liked to have uh, spent some time on also tansier 10 which is a little bit earlier um but really was this um project to to shut down um art you know artists coming together to shut down tam's um, Supermax prison and the the mud stenciling action that was in one of my first slides is a is an emanation of that and I think maybe related we can ask maybe we can ask Maria if um, if that was any you know part of the backdrop to the the power wash stencil because it's also a kind of way of stenciling um, hi David <laughs> stenciling um, uh, uh, you know, stenciling onto a surface in a way that is wash, you know, easily washable or or is not like not permanently marking. So it's kind of evading, um, evading the issue of illegality in that way. Okay, Jennifer. Hi, um, I was wondering when Charles Wilson Peel was deciding was dividing up his museum. Do you have any good documents? Of, you know, to, how did he articulate what he was doing and what would go where? Oh, that's a good question. I'm not sure that I've, I, I, I think there are some documents, but I haven't looked at them. I've, I've gotten, I've got that from secondary, um, secondary materials. And that's something that I would like to, I, I would like to spend a little time with. Um, I mean, it definitely like the, the, the Native American materials stayed in the, the museum and didn't go to the academy, like very clearly. Um, and, um, and then, you know, I think there were other, there are things from, other parts of the world also that stayed there. So it was really, I mean, it was about like European things going to the academy, but I don't know about kind of exactly how he articulated that. 
but that would be a really good that that moment of decision like what goes where if it's articulated in you know in things that he wrote would be a really good kind of text to look at thank you uh yeah we've got some good suggestions um yeah the mca organizing um which is so i mean this is just another whole another whole feature of this is kind of uh, artists and workers in museums um you know uh which has been happening in new york it's been happening here in chicago um kind of getting getting institutions to you know to think about labor issues to think about racial equity issues in a in a really authentic way and not just about like making statements you know these these sort of supportive statements of black lives matter but actually kind of thinking about how the how the logic the carceral logic and or white supremacy i mean very like closely combined are um are played out in this in the structures and the relationships within the institution so um you know and and you know thinking it it would be interesting to think about Kind of what what happens between the early 19th century that i'm talking about and you know that i mean i know you know i know what's going on by the 1960s but i'm like a little fuzzier on kind of in you know the in-between period um which obviously you know that a lot is having there was a really wonderful um talk by uh a warnock lecture by mabel wilson about the smithsonian this past week that was just terrific and and um about the building of the smithsonian using slave labor and kind of all the sort of the Kind of um, historical background to that, and in, 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 in relation also to westward expansion. So, um, so that's that's uh, you know an interesting, and not not too much later than what I'm talking about. Uh, all right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you, Maria. Yes, using, using subtraction like that, that seemed that's a really important aspect of that of the Yolo Kali piece. Um, Frida, yes, thank you. Um, yeah, that's right, Attica. Um, I have not investigated that, but I should for sure. Um, I mean, I've like, I, I've kind of looked at Attica a little bit in other contexts, but, um, but that's um, that exhibition, I don't know, so I will look at it. Um, yeah. Uh, yes, Jennifer. Yeah, Benny Anders would be a really interesting kind of crossover with his work in the prison and then also with institute with museums and challenging boycotting and, you know, withdrawing and, yeah. um, you know, everything that he and his coalition and, and various other permutations of artists and critics did at that time but yeah this he specifically because he also did this prison work yeah okay. yeah yeah so i'm some great comments. Thank you so much. Attica, yeah. Back so back in the early 1970s, is that part of the title? No, it was back during that period. Oh, I think okay, it, was okay. it was back. Then. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Oh, Attica, right. Okay. Yeah, thank you. So I think we're winding down as far as questions are concerned. Anyone and anyone else? Is that Yelena? Yeah. 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 I just I just wanted to um, highlight how much I appreciate um, you're talking about this sort of like larger network of care that some of these projects produce, specifically because the carceral logic extends beyond the prison and the way that it really affects you know, whole communities of people. And I think that it's not just kind of wishy-washy that these projects, um, you know, work with with people both inside and outside. Um, and it kind of, I mean, it, it makes me think of projects like, you know, Jackie Summel's um, solitary, um, solitary Prisons 
and solitary gardens, excuse me, and these kind of networks of, of these sort of institutions that these projects create outside of the institution that reach into and extend outside um, to create these networks of, of connection and, and care really. Um, I think that's really important and I think it's kind of lost by sort of critics of this sort of social practice, um, practice art. So I just wanted to say that. Thank you. Yeah, I was realizing as I was as I was thinking. I mean, this is a kind of a different, a different on a different register, but similar in terms of like the what's like um, what's included as part of the art when it gets kind of studied and exhibited and that kind of thing is just. I, I'd like to um, ask Maria, um, maybe not right now, but at some other point about the Yolo Kali project in terms of like the the you know. The relationships among the students and the the kind of the the, the social practice of that project and how it um, and how it might reflect the sort of you know the the learning process as like the, so they you know the messages that they put up were the ones that were approved but they must have, they obviously came up with other messages too and how like thinking through kind of even thinking through the relationship to the authorities saying like, no, you can't do, you can't do this, you, you can do this, like having to like have, like have, having to go through that experience. It seems like that, like thinking of that as all part of the project and not just like the, the images that appear on the, on the wall or the sidewalk as the project. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know if she wants to speak to that now, but <laughs> Jennifer's saying she, maybe she would, maybe she could speak to that now, but it just, it seems like the, the sort of the, the networks and the relationships around these, around these projects are so important and so much part of the work. Yeah, and should be part of the kind of scholarly apparatus around studying it. Yeah. Um, just as with, you know, performance. And... Right. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, so um, it looks like um, our time is up and um, I want to thank Rebecca. This was just an unbelievable lecture and it has so many future thoughts and all sorts of really good things could come from this, um, <clears throat> as well as all of you. Thank you so much for the chat function. Um, uh, correct me, Kara, but I think that gets saved along with the um, notes. So a lot of great resources here. Um, which makes this even more relevant than it already is. So um, thanks to everyone today for joining us. And um, I look forward, our next um, one will be March 20th, I believe, 21st at 2 p.m. So um, another great lecture. Um, if you go to our website and scroll under the in focus in the search function, lots of search functions today, um, you'll find a listing of our next couple of lectures. So thanks again. And thanks to Leslie Scatone, our board member and exhibitions co-chair that um, helped plan all this and made the contact with Rebecca. So we're really excited to have you all here today. So thanks again. Feel free to email me with questions if any, you know, my email is probably readily available. So if, if anyone has additional questions or wants to follow up, I'd, I'd love to talk to people. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank thanks.